In this tutorial, I want to look a little bit at the possibility of depicting a network, a social network, in a QGIS map. It's pretty easy to do this in some off-the-shelf social network analysis programs, including the online tool Palladio. But it is also possible to do this directly within QGIS. Today, I'm basically going to be following through um, a tutorial that Anita Grosser has made on her blog uh, in this posting about flow maps in QGIS, no plugins needed. You can find the instructions for doing everything that I'm going to demonstrate here directly on this web page, but there are a few points in the blog entry that I thought were a little less than clear for beginning users of QGIS. I'm also going to be combining a few tips from another book that Anita Grosser co-edited called uh, QGIS Map Design uh, in one of the chapters that's located there. So what are we trying to do here? Let's start by taking a look at some data. In this particular example, I have some node and edge data that uh, I would normally use in software for visualizing social networks. In the nodes table, which is the dots in a social network graph um, representing here by individuals and various attribute information about them, and edge tables, which shows uh, relationships between um, individuals. What I'd like to do is um, add some information in here about the locations that these individuals are in. You can see that there is, in the node table, a uh, column for location, but um, none of these have latitudes and longitudes that are useful when we bring them into um, QGIS. So what I did in a separate uh, example was uh, I went and looked up the latitudes and longitudes for a number of different locations. And if I just copy these into um, a fresh example for us to demonstrate today, I have then created a new sheet and called it locations and just pasted this data in here. You can do this a whole bunch of different ways. Um, normally, I just go into Google Maps. Um, I right click at the location roughly in the center of the city, um, and I choose what's here, and that will uh, then show the information, including the latitudes and the longitudes. So once you've looked up the unique places that are mentioned in um, this table here, um, it would then be useful to get the latitudes and the longitudes um, actually into this node table. So I'm going to put in uh, lat and long as two empty columns here. I've shown in another um, tutorial how I used the lookup function to go from a situation where I had only the names of these individuals in an edge table to grabbing those ideas, IDs from another column. I'm going to use the same principle here um, to grab the latitudes and longitudes in another sheet uh, on the basis of this location. So let's do that right now. I put in equals and I'm going to use lookup. What is it that I want to look up? I want to know where is the latitudes and the longitudes, or in this case, just the latitude for Tegu. Where am I going to find Tegu? Well, I'm going to find it in the A column. And what is it that I want to return? I want to return the data that's in the B column. Now, for this to work, one thing is really important. This table has to be sorted. As you can see, it's currently an alphabetical list. If it's not sorted, you'll get a number, but it'll be the incorrect number. So if this worked correctly, we would expect Tegu to be at the latitude of 35.8501. Let's check that. 
Tegu 35.8501. Uh, so that seems to be correct. So I can now just drag this down and it should show the latitudes for all of these locations. Let's repeat the process now for longitude. I'm going to look up the location just as before and oh, I'm going to look up the location there. You know what, I'm just going to start fresh here. All right, look up the location. It's important you um, put a comma afterwards. And then I'm going to go here. And where am I going to find that information? I'm going to find it in the location column. Press comma again. And what is the information that I would like to grab? I would like to grab the longitude this time. So I'm going to then put a close parenthesis. And if this is correct, Tegu should be at a longitude of 128.622. Tegu 128.622, that seems to be correct. And I can now just drag down like this. So I've now added latitude and longitude data. Um, it is possible to do this inside of QGIS as well, but just as easy to get it done before you bring the data into QGIS. So I have the latitude and longitude information that's equivalent to this particular location um, using the lookup command. So this is my nodes data here. Uh, I'm going to uh, export that information as uh, a UTF-8 comma separated values. Um, and this is my nodes table. I'm going to save that in my screencast collection here for data. I'm going to walk through all of the warnings here because I'm it's, it's worried about me destroying this format. And then um, I also want to export the edge data, uh, which I'm also going to need to bring into um, QGIS. I'm going to call this edges. Again, a CSV UTF-8. Save it as a CSV file there. And uh, that's pretty much all we need to do in Excel. Now we're back in QGIS and it's time for us to import this data in. I think the first thing I'm going to do just to have something in the background for us to work with is uh, to bring in the natural earth data coastlines uh, information. And I know that all of my points are going to have to do with Asia. So one thing that I'd like to do is to uh, I th actually, I can just leave it like this. I think it'll be fine. Um, you can project this in a number of different ways. And the QGIS map design book has uh, nice little instructions um, to get this looking like a globe. So it's a little, little more curved here. Um, but that's a more advanced feature we can, we can save for another tutorial. I have a coastline now. Now let's bring in some of this um, table data that we were just playing with. I'm going to import it as a CSV. I'm going to go find the file that I just exported out in my screencast folder here. The nodes. And this has point coordinates that are going to be grabbed from the latitude and the longitude. It's a long way from the North Pole to the South Pole, so that's the vertical lines. The vertical lines will tell us how far we are to um, the uh, left or right. So latitude, so that X field is going to be the longitude and the Y field is going to be the latitude. And I'm gonna leave it in WGS84. And that looks good, so I'm going to press the Add button. If I close this now, and um, if I just make this a black dot, you can see that our points are showing up here. Uh, and they're in fact 
uh, multiple overlapping points because if we go into the attribute table uh, insofar as we have more than one individual in a given city we'll have overlapping um, points this is something to keep in mind if you try to visualize any kind of network is overlapping points means that when you get relationships between individuals in different places um, how are you going to be able to make it clear that this is coming from and connecting to uh, different nodes? Something to keep in mind. Now let's bring in the um, other table, our edges. And our edges has no geometry data. There's no uh, information in here that suggests uh, anything other than um, our uh, from and uh, uh, the to in terms of the person. However, it does have um, the ID number, ID from and ID to, which is something we're going to use. So we have a table without geometry, and we have uh, geometry, that is to say, latitudes and longitudes in the node table here. Now the next sta stage comes from Anita Grosser's uh, tutorial. She says the way for us to get from uh, a, an edges table and a nodes table is to create something called a virtual layer. So let's walk through the step that she's describing here. I'm gonna follow her instructions by going up to add layer, add or edit virtual layer. And here's the query box where she has that text. Um, I'm just gonna bring it in from here. This was the text that she used in her example, but I'm going to have to make a few changes here. Um, these are the titles of things in her uh, example, and we need to use the things that are in our edges table. If I open this up here, you can see the titles of uh, the, the columns there. Let's leave that open as we as we play with the virtual layer here. Um, I don't have a start ID. I have an ID from. I don't have a dest ID. I have an ID to. And I also, like in her example, have a number of other things I want to bring in. I want to bring in kind, intensity, year start, and year end. And I'm not going to include the from and to uh, these are actually keywords in uh, SQL, and I'm a little worried that if I bring those in, they it may cause some problems. Make it'll now make a line uh, from the from point to the to point, uh, and this is from the edges table, and it's going to join it to information from the nodes table, and I need to again replace this edges dot id from. And I need to update this to be what I have, which is ID2. And just to see if this looks like it's looking OK, I'm going to test it. And it says no error. That, that's a good sign. And if I add this and close, we can now see it has created a, a bunch of lines uh, between these different locations. Now, as uh, as Anita Grosser points out in her blog, these lines are not terribly attractive. Um, curved lines would be a lot better. So we're going to continue following her suggestion here. She points out that if you make these lines into uh, lines with arrows, you'll end up with curves, but uh, we need to um, have lines with at least, I think she said, three points in them. So what she suggests is that we um, s basically go in and uh, change this such that we add a geometry generator. And we're not dealing with polygons here, we're dealing with lines. And the geometry generator will allow us to use all of the toolbox of commands and uh, uh, variables that are available to us in uh, in QGIS. I'm going to be copying and then modifying slightly her code. Um, she 
divides it into two parts so that you can see what's going on. In the first, she shows uh, that by just doing this, you'll end up with lines that have uh, a kind of a, a division in the middle of it. Um, so she adds more code uh, that uh, will set things up nicely once we change things to um, uh, to uh, um, the arrow uh, approach. Okay, when I click the apply button, you'll see here is that uh, straight line with multiple divisions in it. Um, I'm going to get rid of the original simple line that was there. And here's the cool part. If you change this to arrow and press apply, now suddenly we have curves. And the curves are controlled in part by the code that um, uh, was put in here. Notice, for example, what happens when I change this number to a 9. Uh, and if I change this to a number closer to 0, you end up with really big curves. It is for this purpose that um, I made a small modification here. Um, I wanted to change it so that I could get a little bit more variety in the curves, especially because we've got multiple lines connecting the same two nodes. Um, since I have a, a column of intensity data in here in the edges, if you look in the attribute table, you can see I have an intensity column, which goes from 1 to 5. And in order to create a little bit more of a variety in the curvature of the lines, um, I replace this negative 5 with a negative 6, plus the intensity, which will vary from 1 to 5, divided by 1.3. And I ended up with something that gives you a little bit more variety in, uh, in the different uh, types of lines. Uh, furthermore, uh, when you go down to styling the arrow itself, uh, under arrow width, I, um, I'll do that next, but uh, under offset, which is to say how much do you offset the line from um, uh, the normal path it might otherwise take. Um, you can fix the number for all of them by putting it here, but you can enter in a variable or kind of a formula in here. And here again, I add a little bit of randomness using a random function where it chooses a number between 1 and 400 and multiplies this by 0 0.01. And this will, this will give us a number between 1 and 4 of various denominations, uh, uh, such as 2.25 here is one example, 3.75 is another one that's produced. And if I click uh, Apply again, you'll see that the number of lines has proliferated a little bit. If you don't like that, and you liked having all of the lines completely overlap, then obviously don't add that in um, and just get rid of that again. Let's clear it and apply. Um, and I'm going to add it back in again. Uh, you know, you can play with the, the functions to get the kind of, of variation that you think works well. Um, and then, uh, in order to further differentiate between some of these lines, um, I also added some variation to the width of the line. In this case, the entire arrow, including its stem, are handled by this arrow width here. I used something called the assistant down at the bottom here. Choosing that, I mapped this variable to the intensity. Uh, which, as you remember, was a number from zero to uh, sorry one to five. You can load that from here, and it shows it's loaded the numbers one to five, which it found in the in the data itself. And we want to translate that into output sizes. That is to say, the width of the line. Currently, I think they're set to zero point six, so something a little bit thinner, zero point three, say, and scale that up to. 
uh, 1.5, say. So uh, the visual effect is not huge, but um, it does add a little bit more of a variety to, to the output. If you find that you have too many points and things start getting too busy, then um, you may not want to add this kind of uh, level of variety to your, your, your chart, but I just wanted to show you how it's done at the very least. Again, um, the color is currently set to be all blue, but what if we were to map the color of the, the um, edges to uh, match the kind of relationship? I've got three different kinds in one column. Um, so let's map this to kind, again using the assistant. And there are actually only three possibilities, three discrete possibilities. And unfortunately, it says here that it will end up with all of these different colors when in fact there's just a one, a two, and a three. Um, one way we can fix that is by reducing the number of different possible gradient stops. So for example, if I delete this stop and I delete that stop, I delete this one, and I delete that one, and I delete this one, and I say discrete, uh, okay, in fact, let's delete one more. We now end up with three colors uh, located at different sides. You, you can mess with this um, so that it comes out properly. Um, and at any rate, we end up with three possible colors now. Uh, this would require a little bit more fiddling. But just to show you what it looks like quickly is now you'll see that the, the colors give an immediate indication of the kind of, of relationship. That could obviously be mapped to any of your variables um, as you see fit. Why don't we add some labels to this? Uh, let's go to switch to our node table. And I'm going to put that above the virtual table so that the nodes are nice and clear. Uh, I'm going to switch on the labels. I'm doing all of this in the layer styling um, panel here. You could also do it by going into the properties of the layer. Uh, single labels. And let's label it with the name of the person. Sorry, not the name of the person. The name of the location. Uh, I'm going to up the font up a little bit. I'm going to switch to uh, something different for the font. And let's see how that looks. Okay, I want to increase the readability, so let's draw a buffer. And now we're beginning to see a little bit more the possibilities of, of visualizing a network in, uh, in uh, QGIS. To be honest, I don't think that this is a very readable uh, visualization. Um, I'm showing this for the purpose of uh, those of you who might have, let's say, a smaller number of key points or relationships, um, or uh, you can have a level of zoom where the lines come out in a much larger variety. But the main point is uh, it's possible to visualize networks natively in QGIS uh, using this kind of method. Now, Anita Grosser's demonstration is about flows in different directions. Um, she styles it here so that when it goes in one direction, when there's a directional network, uh, it shows you one color, and when it goes in the other way, it's another color. That would be really nice for immigration flows, for example. Um, but if it's immigration flows, then it's networks, uh, a relationship between not a person in Seoul and a person in Tokyo, but um, the relationship is between Seoul and Tokyo itself. And then the edge column that would be styling that line between Seoul and Tokyo would be the amount of the flow, let's say the number of people who have moved from one place to another. That will allow you to have a much simpler map. Well, can you do that with people as well? I think so. I think if you were to aggregate the relationships between the cities, say everyone who, if there's, let's say, five people in Guangzhou who have a relationship with somebody in Shanghai, then if we had a way, and uh, Excel, again, is probably the place to do this, 
if you have a way to aggregate the total number of uh, unique combinations of locations, then uh, you know you count up the total number of Dalian to Guangzhou relationships, then it'll become like the example of migration flows between them. Um, but that's something we can explore in another tutorial.